The Russians are reflexing. Behaviorism. History of Psychology. Professor Michael Botwin. Department of Psychology. California State University. Fresno. In this installment of the History of Psychology, we're going to look at the work of the early Russian physiologist who started to look at excitatory and inhibitory responses in the nervous system. The great finding that the Russian Sektinov made was that there are indeed inhibitory neurons in the brain that fire to stop behavior as well as excitatory nerves that fire to start behavior. This leads to a track of Russian scholars. We're primarily going to talk about Sektinov, Bekhterev, and then, of course, Pavlov. Hopefully, I'll teach you a little bit about Pavlov that you haven't seen before. For example, his motto of personality. So, on with the show. As usual, a couple of cartoons to start us off. Here's the first one. Unbeknownst to most students of psychology, Pavlov's first experiment was to ring a bell and cause his dog to attack Freud's cat. You can yuck now. This one needs no explanation. Let's start with Ivan Sakhtinov. Sakhtinov was a Russian that discovered inhibitory mechanisms in the brain. This led Sakhtinov to conclude that psychology could be studied in the context of physiology. He denied that thoughts directly caused behavior and believed that external sensory stimulation in turn causes all behavior. According to Sakhtinov, all behavior is experienced as a reaction to the motor movement of the muscles. Our next Russian is Vladimir Bektorov. He studied with Vant de Bodrimen and the hypnotist Charcot, who Freud also studied with. Bektenroff is known primarily for his contributions to reflexology, and Bektenroff believed that the relationship between environmental influences and overt behavior was key to understanding how organisms learned and behaved. He found the same type of reflex reflexive reaction in humans and other animals and studied conditioned reflexes about the same time as Pavlov did. Uh, we don't know Bekhterov as much as Pavlov because Pavlov was translated and Bekhterov wasn't. He developed many ideas that were similar to many of the early behaviorist ideas of the day, and these weren't discovered by the West until after the fall of the Soviet Union. He became a priest in the Russian Orthodox Church. Pavlov himself early on traded for the priesthood and later enrolled in medical school. He used the latest surgical, te surgical techniques excuse me, to study digestion by preparing what was called a gastric fistula and dogs. Basically, that was a tube to collect the juices from the stomach or sometimes the mouth or the esophagus, depending on his study. He studied different gastric secretions in animal stomachs and won the Nobel Prize for his work in digestion in 1904. One of the things that Pavlov is most noted for is his idea of the cortical mosaic. Now, Pavlov studied both excitatory and inhibitory behavior and believed that there was a pattern of this in the brain at any time, and it determines how the organism will respond to cues in the environment. 
whether it will behave in an excitatory way or it will not behave at all and be inhibited. All central nervous activity, according to Pavlov, is characterized as either excitatory or inhibitory stimulation. And he bases this on the idea that all behavior is reflexive, and it's reflexive due to an antecedent or a stimulus that causes that behavior. Through experience, organisms learn to inhibit reflexive behavior. And we do this all the time. We learn to, for example, hold a warm bowl coming out of the microwave when our hands reflexively say drop it. Here's a BBC video on Pavlov. Pavlov's aim was to discover what caused saliva to flow. He rerouted the saliva ducts to the outside of his dog's cheek so that he could collect and measure the spit. Perhaps, Perhaps he, thought he thought the production of saliva might be the result of a fixed nervous reflex, like a knee jerk. Mm. Yes, we know so great can separate. After taking many measurements of spittle, he confirmed that the dogs drooled automatically when their tongues touched food. He called the response the salivation reflex. But his work started to run into trouble. As his dogs became familiar with the experimental routine, they started to fill their cheek tubes before Pavlov had a chance to stimulate their tongues. The dogs were learning to anticipate food. Pavlov tried a new technique. He erected screens so that the dogs couldn't see what was going on. Before passing meat through the hatch, he introduced a stimulus that was totally unrelated to feeding. A ticking metronome. At first, the dog dripped saliva into its cheek tube only when the food appeared. But after, but after a number of trials, of trials the, dog the dog began to connect the ticking with the arrival of meat. Soon the sound alone made the dog drool. Eventually, the dog salivated as much to the ticking itself as it did originally to the presentation of food. Hold there! It is to that. He called this new response the conditioned reflex. Whatever the stimulus, his dogs could soon be conditioned to produce saliva. Pavlov believed that he had discovered how animals learned even in the wild. Bell rings, I get a treat. Bell rings, I get a treat. It went on for days, then out of the blue. Bell rings, I get nothing at all. Nada. I mean, can you seriously call my attack unprovoked? The dark truth about Pavlov's dogs. Here's Pavlov in a picture of with an experimental dog all wired up to salivate and in this case the animal looks like is having juices collected from the stomach 
Now, Pavlov is most famous for discovering the conditioned reflex, as you've seen in the BBC video that we just saw. The big thing to remember about classical conditioning or Pavlovian conditioning is that behavior is elicited by a stimulus. The stimulus is a cue to behave. Here's our basic terminology for the conditioning process according to Pavlov. First of all, we have the unconditioned stimulus. This is something that actually occurs naturally in the environment, and its presentation causes the unconditioned response. For example, food causes salivation in dog's mouth. Unconditioned response. This is an innate response to a stimulus in the environment. In other words, salivating when eating. We also have the conditioned stimulus. This is a stimulus that is learned by the organism through pairing with an unconditioned stimulus. For example, in classical conditioning, our good old bell. The conditioned response is the new learned behavior. It is the result of pairing an unconditioned stimulus with an unconditioned, or excuse me, The conditioned response. This response is the new learned behavior. It is the result of pairing the unconditioned stimulus and the conditioned stimulus. Before learning, the conditioned response is often called the neutral stimulus. And this will result, for example, in a dog salivating to the sound of a bell. Here is a classic Psych 10 textbook picture of the Pavlovian conditioning setup. Uh, a nice clean artist rendition. You can see the observation screen, tube for collecting saliva, container of meat powder, a device to count the drops of salivation, and a more modern appliance a drum for recording responses. So here's how classical conditioning works. You have a natural relationship. Food is an unconditioned stimulus that leads to salivating, which is an unconditioned response. You have a neutral stimulus, which is the bell, which by itself does not elicit any behavior. The bell, the neutral stimulus, is paired with the unconditioned stimulus, and the dog still salivates when it sees the food. Eventually, over multiple trials, ringing the bell will lead to salivating and the unconditioned stimulus will become the conditioned response. Extinction occurs when the conditioned stimulus is repeatedly presented without the unconditioned stimulus. In other words, constantly ringing the bell without any supply of food which is just what I saw. If, however, you reintroduce food, you get spontaneous recovery and the animal will relearn the response in a very short period of time. There are some oddities that Pavlov showed. One of those is experimental neuroses. He showed dogs to stimuli, a circle, and an ellipse. The dog received food after seeing the circle, but not the ellipse. So, according to Pavlov, the ellipse elicited inhibition, and the circle 
elicited salivation, or as Pavlov would most likely say, excitation. Pavlov then manipulated the circle so it appeared more like an ellipse. And when the two stimuli became indistinguishable, he found the animal had simultaneously inhibitory and excitatory responses, which led down out to the animal having a breakdown in behavior and acting very frustrated, acting very anxious. And Pavlov used these type of experiments to explain mental illness. He also talks about first versus second signal learning. First signal learning is learning that is related to eliciting some kind of signal that a biologically significant event is going to occur. Pavlov also referred to this as the first signals of reality. Second signal learning occurs when an individual has built a relationship between, for example, words and physiological or environmental experiences. These symbols guide our behavior as they would represent events in the real world. So, for example, if I had you think about eating a very nice meal and I start describing it to you, even though I haven't shown you any food, based on my language, you may salivate to hearing me tell the tale of my favorite new restaurant. Pavlov also developed a rudimentary theory of personality based on what he noted as the strength of the nervous system. And he believed that some personality types had strong nervous systems, which were primarily driven by excitatory impulses, and other organisms had weak nervous systems that were guided by inhibitory responses. Pavlov even related his system to Galen's humoral model that we talked about far earlier in class. He believes that temperament interacted with the learning process in systematic ways. For example, a high-strung small dog like a chihuahua may behave radically different than a large, calmer dog like, well, anything's calmer than a chihuahua, but like maybe a Labrador retriever. There were things that he noticed. First of all, the caloric and melancholic temperaments were relatively stable, he thought caloric being based on the excitatory nervous system, melancholic on the inhibitory. He thought that the sanguine and phlegmatic type were more balanced and stress resistant than the other two types of humors. And the Russians developed a theory of personality based on the strength of nervous system that wasn't known by the West until after the fall of the Soviet Union. It quite parallels Hans Eysenck's theory of personality. Well, animals freeze when they are in a state of fear. Here's a frozen fox. Here's the literal deer in the headlights. And here is a woman frozen with her eyes staring into the headlights. What did Pavlov say about this type of phenomena? He talked about an idea he called Ulta Maximal Inhibition. And Pavlov says that severe stress produces situations which result in this form of inhibition. Comparable to the effects of psychological shock, ultramaximal inhibition may 
result from extreme biological insight insult excuse me something very extreme very traumatic and pavlov believed that this assault on the nervous system by such an intense stimuli caused the brain to convulse into a state of inhibition if the entire cortex is in an inhibitory mode the organism would be unresponsive and you'd get this freezing type of behavior in addition this may be protective as it blocks input from even more threatening situations or more devastating overstimulation so comrades you've got a brief view of early russian classical conditioning processes and psychology the russian government general generously funded pavlov's research and built him an extremely sophisticated laboratory to do his work in pavlov is one of those individuals that if you were to ask lay people to name psychologist he would count we would count pavlov in well comrades we finish our discussion of the early russian reflexologist and focused on the work of pavlov pavlov is one of those folks who all lay people seem to know about his work as a psychologist even though he would find individuals working in his lab who called themselves psychologists, Pavlov preferred to be a physiologist. His work went way beyond the simple learning reflex in classical conditioning, and later in his life he got interested in problems of mental illness and things like that. We covered a little bit of that at the end of this lecture. Hopefully you'll have been conditioned to click on Future History of Psychology Lectures. Have a good one. This has been a We Have Couches video production, copyright 2020, Professor Michael D. Vontlin, all rights reserved. Doesn't that ring a bell? See you next time. Bye.